Amen. We first start of our evening classes and don't have as much time as normal, so we're going to get right into our presentation. We're going to start off by having those who didn't get to see last night, see, and to make their presentation. But before we do that, let's go to God and pray. Father, to the Lord, let's pray. Amen. I just want to remind everybody why we are here. We are empowering, preparing, motivating brethren for greater service in the vineyard of our, of our Lord. And service by both male and females in their various spheres of endeavor. Uh, we, the future of the church, will be in the hands of brethren like yourself who are willing to work in the secular arenas and yet be willing to give adequate um, professional well all the time to the work of the kingdom we the church requires that we treat the lord's business as we would our own personal business and that is with the same level of professionalism and um, diligence and commitment that we would our own heroes of, of life. And so we also want to, before we have our next set of speakers, I just want to deal with the issue of when you stand before an audience to speak. Now, in this course, we are paying particular attention public speaking on the part of both male and female because we know that on various occasions both sex have to speak publicly and therefore we want you to have the skills of public speaking and we are paying in the course we are actually going to pay close attention we are going to dot the eyes and cross the feet the very every aspect of your Preparation. For when you stand for an order to speak, you must be dressed for the occasion. And the occasion will vary, but you must come in the attire appropriate to the occasion. Remember many, many years ago, a preacher got up to speak and he had on a, a pink suit. Pink, it was actually pink. And I mean, the, the color of the suit was so distracting that. I mean, body was like, <laughs> what is he doing up there in that pink suit? Right? So his outfit sort of distracted. So uh, basically, modest dress um, is important. Appropriate dress is important. It just depends on whether it's a wedding or it's a, you're speaking at a ladies' fellowship or preaching or whatever it is. You must know. Setting. Then rest. You want to be prepared to speak and make sure you get a good night's rest. Because we are not training you to be public readers. We are training you to be public speakers. So a lot of public speech today, people are reading well. <laughs> but that's not what we are training to do. We are training you to. 
you have your nose, but basically your eyes, you're making eye contact with your audience regularly throughout. And you don't have to be reading the script. Your preparation of your speech is only halfway through. It's only halfway through when you have written your speech. When you have written your speech, good. Now it's now time to get it in your brain. Not word for word. But basically you know what's what you're supposed to be saying. So rest is not important. Spiritual preparation is important. Uh, always say a prayer before you get up. But realize that when you get up in the district, especially in the church environment, uh, you have an opportunity to speak on behalf of God. God is in the name of Jesus Christ. If you're teaching a ladies class, or you're speaking to a ladies leadership, you are doing it in the name of Jesus Christ. The men get up in the assembly. You want to do, you want to say that which the Lord has written. All right? So, uh, you say a prayer. You must be able to think your speech through. That is, we are not training you to read your speech. We are training you to see your speech. Basically, you know what, what you want to say in the beginning, in the middle, in the end. That is, you look, say that your speech has been written out and you have it written You look down, you know what's there. You don't know, you don't know what's there, word for word, but you know what you need to say, right? And therefore, you look down, you know, you have gone through several times and therefore you are able to present or think your speech through and what you are about to say and do through preparation. One of the keys to public speaking is Preparation. Preparation. I remember many years ago, Bill Clinton spoke at the, the, the Democratic Convention. It was just when Obama was being elected. Being elected. He said he took, he spent six months preparing the speech. And he spoke for about 50 minutes. And you could tell he had walked through that speech many, many times. Right? And that's how he was able to do it. And so, review of your speech is key. When you stand before an audience to speak, and I've heard this being said on the radio, you know, but I would say for quite some time. When you get up before an audience to speak, the first thing you do is don't speak. Don't speak. Okay. When you stand before an audience and speak, you get up there, first of all, when you're walking up, do not say anything. They get before the audience. For two to three seconds, you just look at your audience. What are you doing in just looking at your audience, saying nothing? Hey, eh? yes, ask me, come here. Yeah. Less and less and less. 
because your mind has to learn to basically photograph your basically photograph your lesson and see your lesson. You have training set to see your lesson. Right? So extemporaneous, you can, but we are training you to have your lesson with you. That's what we're basically doing. And then what, what can I do? Let me walk your brain here. chapter 4 verse 13 Paul says give attention to reading to exhortation and to doctrine that's why he says to Paul to Timothy right so Christians must read <laughs> right and that's how you went into the ex the oh I'm sorry you're you're fine yeah no, I was answering you're saying about um, Paul's before you start yes Right, so the aim of the pause of three seconds is to say, I'm ready. <laughs> then the one is there looking, oh, she's ready. He's ready. Right? So that three, three second pause, three to five second pause, is a means of getting attention. And then eye contact. One of the keys in public speaking is to make eye contact across the range of your audience. Front, the back, side, one side, the other side. Maintain eye contact as often as possible. And then you're going to begin calmly, first of all, strongly. That evening, good morning must be strong. You must address your audience. The last person in your audience was hearing. The last person. So you see I told you up here in the auditorium. And you're at the front there. And you don't realize that for an auditorium at the side, you have to project. You have to project towards the back. Yeah. <laughs> so, so speak to the last person in your audience as you're speaking. Right? So and then so you you must have a certain level of confidence, you must have a pleasant look on your face. And get up, speak up, and shut up. <laughs> get up, say what you have to say, 
and sit down. Okay? You must work up. You know how you're going to start your speech, what is the body of your speech, and how you're going to conclude your speech. Many, many sermons have been offered in which a preacher has not worked out how he's going to end his speech. And therefore, this, the latter half of the speech is just one or he's looking for a way out, but he hasn't worked it out yet. So he must work on no man, must end up in a world of how you will end your speech. So basically, your speech must, be, must have three portions to it. One, your introduction. Two, your body. Your, let's say you were just speaking on five things I learned. So far, when the body or public speech will be able to find it. And then your conclusion will be a quick review and an appeal to your audience. You always want to appeal to the audience because basically, what's the point of giving five lessons if you are not encouraging people to embrace these five lessons? Okay, so please bear these things in mind. When you get up to speak, don't make excuses about what you're about to say. Meaning, suppose you have been up all night and the baby had been crying. Or you came, you know, you had an accident or whatever. Don't say that in the announcement. <laughs> you don't want people to be distracted by your situation. All right? You must get up there and speak as if nothing happened. Just, just do your best. Just do your best. No excuses. So when I had to speak after Brother Mitchell, I just got up there and said what I had to say. Is that in this part. They want to begin strong and end strong. And this takes preparation. <laughs> preparation. Work it out how you're going to begin it and how you're going to end it. Now, many times when you're going to speak, you're on your focus. <laughs> Are you just focusing on yourself? Focusing on yourself. Focus on blessing your audience. What you have to say is very important. The audience needs to hear it. Probably what you have to say the first time. Some would have thought of it from that angle. I remember speaking last time. I said everything that was said. I said, that's interesting. Never heard, I never thought of it from that angle. Right? So you want to bless your audience in what you have to say. Right? So rather than focusing on how, how nervous you are, focus on blessing your audience. You want to share something with them that's very important. You have thought about it, and it's something that you want them to hear. To cut here. So concentrate on blessing your audience rather than on yourself. Be brief but thorough. And bear in mind the KISS principle, if I know the you know what, right? Some people know how to keep it and sleep. All right, there have been other ends to that S, but I won't go a little bit after this time. Okay, we'll go first. And go back for that. Everybody has signed their attendance, but we have not. Everybody has not signed. I must say we are glad to have everyone here today. You are the future. Well, imagine the pulpit is right here. Genesis chapter 3. My topic is 
the naked truth. Now, God had said, Thou shalt not be of this truth, nor touch it, for you will die. The serpent inserted one word and changed all that God had said. The naked truth that has only taken one word causes us to disobey God and fall into temptation. As simple as this word sounds, um, as small as it looks, Everyone can spell it basically at age two or less. This word is not ordinary. The word is not. The native truth. Not is a little, but hollow, as we would see in Jamaica. Nothing had brought sin in this world. Sorry, not had brought sin in this world. It calls us to be enemy with God. It gives us the feeling that it is not a big thing. God is just a white line. Nothing ordinary transpired since that day. That our four parents inserted not in their appetite to enjoy the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eye. <laughs> the naked truth. Not all nuts are bad. Let us look at some of the good ones. In Exodus 20, we read about it. Thou shalt not have other gods before me. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbors. But there are times in this same word can be so dangerous. God has said, Thou shalt not eat of this fruit, nor touch it, or you will die. And so, our the fourth one, they did what God said they are not Now, if we believe we shall not perish, what we do? God has given us the option to choose the good nuts and the bad nuts. Now the naked truth. We must not change God's word. We must do what he says at all times. Not everything that later is good. God is merciful. Even if we they have given us the option and you know, have a chance to make it right with him. He will not condemn us. Let us turn to James 1, uh, James 1 and verse 17. Sorry, James 1 and verse 14. But everyone is tempted and is drawn away of his own lust and intense. In conclusion, God has given us the chance to make it right with him. So if we have chosen the wrong path, God has given us a chance to use the right one. Amen. Okay, Sister Sharon, that's our first speech, and the first speech is draws no comment from you. No. 
apart from when the first speech. You know why? They want you to be their second, <laughs> and their third, and their fourth, and their fifth. Meaning, um, getting up here is, is a challenge. You know that. And we, everybody has to break their dogs in the cricket, you know, the cricket term. Everybody has to go and be their first. I tell the story all the time. I gave my first speech in my I think first speech. First speech, what I think. Did my second speech in my own family. Because someone played that first speech. <laughs> 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 and I knew exactly what she was doing. <laughs> she did not want the first five bundle. <laughs> Is that your first speech? In your first speech, you get all the And then the second speech is better than the first speech. You need to build and build and build. And who's next? Five lessons I've learned. The continuation of last time. I mean, just add to her. What I like about it is that we very simple. All right. It has a simple. To which you can tell exactly what she's talking about. And I think three years ago, I remember her first presentation with good knots on the flat knots. Um, right. It was very, yes, it was right. very easy for you to call it and to remember. And then also, you could give that title, you see that naked truth? You could give that title for all five parts. You see, yeah. that title could be given for that all five parts. About what I've learned. I learned the native truth. All right? Okay. Who's next? Good point. Good point. Who's next? Who didn't speak? Jennifer didn't speak last time. She's a cool person. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hyatt, and I'm a member of the Wonder Church of Christ. Today, I'll be talking about the five lessons you learn as a Christian. First, I've learned that to be a Christian and to be rooted and grounded, after have to make time to study God's word and to make sure that I spend time meditating on his word. I, I have to make sure I spend time reading and studying because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and his word was God. And to be a good Christian, I have to be equipped with his word so I can do good work. As, as Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17 reminds me, Second, I've learned to spend time in praying. This is the confidence as a Christian that I can go to God whenever I am depressed or when I have trouble sometimes or anything. I can go to God in prayer. So prayer is my tool, is my power, is my everything. So I have to spend time praying. And third, I have to love. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. And as, as, as first John 4 verse, it reminds me that if I don't love, I don't know God. And because God is love, as first Corinthians 13 45 reminds me, so I have to be make sure that I love each other as I go by each day. And forgiveness. What is forgiveness? I will learn the importance of forgiveness. Forgiveness cannot receive unless I acknowledge my need for God's forgiveness. My imperfect condition so as a Christian I have no right to withhold forgiveness from my brothers and sisters so I have to learn to forgive quickly 
and fifth, humbleness and humility. Both go together. I have learned as a Christian, I need to be to have a humble heart. God break down the throne and save the humble. Job 22, verse 29, and Matthew 23, verse 12. He that exalts himself will be abased. And as a Christian, I can't exalt as I'll be abased. I have to be humble. In conclusion, I have learned that life on earth is just the dress rehearsal for the production that I will spend far more time on the other side of death in eternity. Then, I will, on this earth, is the stage in here, the preschool, trying out for my life in eternity. It is the practice workout before the actual game, the warm up, the, the lap before the race begins. This life is preparation for the next. So tonight as we gather here, remember that we are preparing for the next life. And so we have to do everything that I just mentioned to stay on the right track, to be rooted and grounded, because we all have a purpose, and the purpose is to make it into the kingdom. I thank you. Amen. All right, I'll let you make comments. I will I hear you, but I'm not listening to you. Right? 
You have really learned to listen, to listen and to hear. And so that is one of the things I've learned. I, I listen to people. I hear them and they speak, but because I do not swallow things easily, I will say, really? We, we both will be hearing the same thing and other people hear differently from what I hear. They are going to say things what they hear. I don't swallow them. I say that we both heard the same things. So how do you hear that? So I've really learned to listen and to hear. Right? The other thing I've learned is to care, to care for others, to assist others in whatever way I can, and to really appreciate people for what they can do or where they are at in life. You appreciate them for it. I've learned to really say to people, thank you. Thank you for this, thank you for that. Thank you for doing this, and really show appreciation. Huh? I have heard that there is so much <laughs> and there is not enough time. <laughs> yes, seriously, there is so much to learn and not enough time to learn. So I've learned to use my time wisely. Do a little of this, a little of that. Yes, I just busy, and we have to get on with other things. So I really learned how to use my time wisely. And, and in summary, another thing. Summary. I have to be more careful. Those who went first because they were the the guinea pigs. The body's learning for what everybody is coming. That's what they really benefit from others. But it really is going to be a plus to you. Listen to what they're saying, watch how they think. For example, her use of humor. I mean, she may have bucked it up, you know, <laughs> but it still came across. And oftentimes, it's um, inadvertently. It comes without really having planned it. It just comes out of you. Right? That people laugh. So, humor is a good, good, good part of it. Who's next? Who's next? Who's next? Who is next and what else? Hey, good night, everyone. My name is Davina from. And the five things I've learned from being a Christian. So, we're in April last month, the 11th of last month, maybe one year since I've been a Christian. So, I got baptized last year, March the 11th. And within that short period of time, the first thing I've learned from being a Christian is that okay, I've learned the true concept of peace. So, the first start, when I got baptized, it was a very enlightening experience because I would always put it off. I would be encouraged to be baptized on and on, but then I would keep on, you know, pushing it off and rescheduling and whatever, whatever. But when the day finally came, when I actually got baptized, it was a good experience because I went down into the water and I don't know if it's just a, if it's just a me thing, but when I went down, it was really 
And I was like, you just feel everything in the yeah, it just goes. <laughs> I don't know what to describe. It's in this It's such a great thing. So it's going to be But it was good. And then when I finally came up, I was so overcome with emotions. I started to cry. And then my whole brother saw me because he's the one that baptized me. So in that moment, I I felt at peace with myself. So like true peace. Yeah. The second thing I've learned is how to appreciate the beauty in nature. So before I was a Christian, I would always look at my surroundings and be like, why is somebody not believing about that? Like, look at this. How, how can this be just a mistake? Some, a being has to be behind this. You know, like, we have to appreciate the beauty in everything. And I don't think it was just a, a big bang that happened or something just out of the blue. I think it was, you know, it's premeditated of uh, being out there, God did all of that. So even as being a Christian now, I've always appreciated the beauty of nature. I look at the trees and I'm like, you know, so God made that like, it's so good. I look at the water, the water feels nice, God is good. Like, you know, so it's still I've learned to appreciate the beauty of nature. I've learned how empty my life was and would be without God. So with being a Christian I've learned that you need your purpose in life. And with, without God, you really don't have a purpose because you're just there. And God's, God is, you know, He's the one that made us who we are. He's the one that shaped us to be how we are, our destinies and our, 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 and our paths in life. So without Him, I realized that my life would be pretty empty because He's blessed me with all my friends and my family and my church family and, you know, they all love each other, so it, it would be pretty empty because, you know, everyone needs friends and everyone needs family. And even if you don't have friends and family, you still need that one person you can depend on. And you know that God is that, you know, God's there for you to always be with and to depend on. You can always pray to Him, you know, be there with unsafe prayers. So I realized that my life would be pretty empty without you. And sometimes when I talk about it, I get really emotional. That's why I don't. So I don't really talk about all that much because God is really great. So every time when I when I speak about Him, it just you know it pricks my heart. So yeah, that's what that's yeah. <laughs> and the fourth thing I've learned is how to be a better friend. So with being a Christian, you have certain qualities you have to uphold. So you have to encourage your friends and you have to be an example to them. Because you can be a Christian, but your friends are safe. So you have to say, you know, that's not good, or we can't be doing stuff like that. You have to treat people better, etc., etc. So, with that said, being a Christian, I automatically upgraded my friendness. So, you know, how we quick I am with being a friend. Because you want the best for your friends. You're surrounding yourself with this group of people. So, you're trying to say, okay, if I'm going to spend my time with you, you're going to have to put up with me and my standards. You can't just put yourself to the sidelines and do whatever you want to do because you know you can't play with your life like that. It's so much more than just the materialistic side of things. You have to look at the spiritual side also. And with that said, you have to be that guide for your friends and you know, being baptized um learn how to be a better mentor and uh example to my friends. And the last thing I've learned is how to trust in God more. And this stems from problems that have been through trials and tribulations of us. Right? So with going through problems, you feel like, oh, God's not there, or where is he when I need him now? Or why aren't you helping me? But you can't really question, you can't question God because he's the one that knows what's best for you. So even though you're going through hard challenges, even though you're going through challenges in life or hardships, it, there's always a backstory to it. There's always God thinking about what we're, you know, he's, he's planning all of this, so he knows what he's doing. And you can't really question God. So you have to trust in him and trust in his plan for you. So that's all I know. That's okay. <laughs>
you to speak in that you really have to be really working to be really, really good at it. To be good at it, you know. So very, very important. Alright, we are going to take more next week. So next no, next time, sorry. Uh, we're going to take more. But I need to do some more work on our Old Testament survey. And I really want to encourage you to read the book of Genesis. Read it through and then get into the book of Exodus. Book of Exodus. Now the book of Genesis covers a period of 2,500 years. It's a, it's a book that covers the greatest, the longest period in the Old Testament. So though Genesis is one of 39 books of the Old Testament, the book itself covers 2,500 years of the estimated 4,000 years of the Old Testament. So Genesis is an extremely significant book. It has covered from creation coming right down to the children of Israel in Egypt. Notice how Genesis ends. It ends with Joseph interacting with his brothers. Father Jacob having died. Now I'd like you to take out your Bibles and let's take a look at the last chapter of Genesis as we are about to launch into Exodus. In Genesis chapter 50. Start from, let's say start from verse 10. And the one who has it Mary. And he came to the first then they came to the threshing floor of Atta, which is beyond the Jordan, and they mourned there with a great and very solemn. So Jacob had died, and they were mourning the death of Jacob, who is also called Israel. So he's, when he speak of the children of Israel, it's really the children of Jacob. Read on. Loudly. He observed seven days of mourning for his, for his father. And when the inhabitants of the land of the Canaanites saw the morning at the threshing floor of Atta, they said, This is the morning of the Egyptians. Therefore, it's so, saying those. Uh, Jacob died in Egypt because the, the entire family had been brought out of by Joseph, who was now deputy to Pharaoh in Egypt. And so, when he died, they decided to take him back to his homeland for burial. So, the Egyptians went in a large entourage to. Okay, read on. Therefore, its name was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond the Jordan. So his sons did for him just as he had commanded. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, before Mamre, which Abraham brought, bought with the field from from the Hittites as prophets in Korah burial. Right, so remember now. Jacob and his family were living in Canaan. They had come down here because they were descendants of Abraham, who had been promised that land. So they had gone there living, and there was a great famine, and it led to them turning to Egypt for food, where Joseph had been sold into captivity. Now, that is a classic example of the providence of God. Providence of God means the word providence comes from the Greek word providential, which means God provides. You know, God provides. God hears. But even when the evil work of Joseph's brothers got him into Egypt, God still found a way to turn it into a blessing for heaven. Because now Joseph was their advanced part in Egypt. And he was the one who brought the family down to Egypt. 
And why were they in Egypt? Because God wanted to, Egypt was their incubator. Egypt was where those 72 Israelites grew into one to two million Israelis. So when Genesis ends, when Genesis ends, Joseph is dead and he said, look, before he died, you're going to take it back. When you leave here, you're going to take it back with you to the promised land. So between the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus is a period of, right, it's now 400 years. 400 years. In that 400 years, the 72 Israelis have grown to 1 to 2 million Israelis. God has used Egypt as a place to build them into a great nation. That's what God has done. Now, let's... Right, what we said here is that there is a time gap between the close of Genesis, close of the events of Genesis, that is, Genesis ends with Joseph dying. And the beginning of the events of Exodus. Genesis ends with Joseph dying. Right? The beginning of Genesis 50, Jacob dies. But the end of Genesis 50, Joseph dies. Right? And before he dies, he says, Take my body back to Canaan in the Lord. But Genesis 50 and verse 20 is a key verse. Genesis 50 and verse 20. But that's for you, you meant evil against me. Alright. That's a proper sentence. Thus you shall say to Joseph. I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brother and their sin, for they did evil to you. All right, so when Jacob dies, the brothers gather before Joseph and they are afraid because they think Joseph is going to take revenge. And they say, Look, before your father died, he said, Please, easy on them. Okay? We are. Now please forgive the trespass. So that's a message that would be conveyed to Joseph. By the Bible saying, in case you were saying this before you die, please what? Please forgive the trespass of the servants of, of the God of your father. Mm -hmm. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Right. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we are your servants. Right? Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I for am I in the face of God. So Joseph knew from a long time that vengeance is my life as a big thing of God. In other words, he says, I'm not in the face of God. I, I have no right to take revenge against me. <laughs> Good boy, <laughs> But as for you, you may look at this now. But I like this. I'm going to answer the As for you, you meant evil. You, you, my brothers, when you saw the Egyptian captain, who meant it for evil? What? For God meant it for good. Is that marvelous? Well, that, that's what you call it. And God can turn that circumstance into something very, very positive. 
He will integrate that was done about 200 years before Christ. It was done by the providence of God. <laughs> Did I tell you the story of the seven years? Let me just tell you quickly again. The children of Israel, I mean, there are two million people Christ. They were a leader in Egypt. You know, Egypt called Ptolemy the Second. Ptolemy the Second was building a huge library in Alexandria, Egypt. And he said he wanted to assemble all books ever written and have it in his library in Alexandria, Egypt. So, he heard from one of the Jewish leaders. Oh, by the way, we have a book, you know. Right? We have the, the books of the world, the, the, the books of the, 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 the law, and the Old Testament books. And he said, I'd like to come to you. So he said, I will pay 70 Jewish scholars to go to a beach house in Alexandria, Egypt. And spend the next few months translating this book from Hebrew in the Greek. So he, he actually paid for it, he financed it. And they came up with this translation called Septuagint. This was the book translation that Jesus read, for, read from the synagogue. And because the New Testament was written in Greek, and the second gen is in the Greek. It means that by the end of the first century, the entire Bible was in Greek. And Greek was the language of, of the day. So that everybody could now read the entire Bible in the language that they knew. Okay. So what Exodus does is to so connect the early history of mankind to Genesis. In other words, Genesis begins with creation, which ends with the of Israel and Egypt. And they have this 400 year gap. Then in Exodus, we see the beginning of God's plan to get the children of Israel. Exodus chapter 1, God's plan to get the children of Israel out of Egypt. He having built them up into a large nation or a large people. So in Exodus chapter 1, the children of Israel are in Egypt and they are. Under bondage. Again, providence of God. They were not under bondage because God instructed. They were under bondage because the Egyptian leaders felt that they had to find a way to, to suppress these Israelites because they had grown into a number that outnumbered even the Egyptians. So they, they enslaved them in order to suppress them. And they gave instructions to the, had to the um, women who had to the birth of, of a mother, they had to have the babies, gave so them. And their child was born, kill them. So when, Joe, when Moses is born, Moses' parents kept him as long as they could. And then, they built a small ark and they put him in the ark and put him in the Nile River. And he was trying to save his life. And by the providence of God, Pharaoh's daughter is in the river at the very same time. Yeah. That was not my murder. That's just how God does his stuff. That's how God does his stuff. That's, 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 that's why we serve him. Because he's encouraged those so called coincidences. Right? It just so happened that he was there. And so when 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 it, when Pharaoh's daughter saw Moses, oh she fell in love with him, I told you. And she said, I'd love to find someone to rescue me in the day. And because Joe's sister was there, I said, Oh, I know somebody, I know somebody. <laughs> and his mother. His mother, his old mother, Linden. his old mother took care of him. Then, 
problems of God. The problems of God. So you can, God is us great and worthy of, of serving. So Exodus connects early history of mankind in Genesis to the development of the new nation. Because at the end of Genesis, we see 72 Israelites in Egypt. And in Exodus, we see the, 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 the Israeli nation or the Hebrew nation taking form. So what this shows is that when God promised Abraham, look at Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1 to 3, when he promised Abraham a great nation, after promise he had made this promise 500 years before, and now he was keeping it. 500 years later, he was keeping it. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, three, please. Now the, Lord the Lord is, now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Right. The latter part, of course, it didn't be described. But in Exodus, in the first four chapters, we see the rise of, of Moses. Moses is raised as Pharaoh's son, adopted as you know, Pharaoh's relative. And he spent 40 years in Pharaoh's household. Again, the God. Because now he is educated as an he's educated as a Egyptian, he learns languages, he learns to write. So, when you come to write the first five books of the book, it's no big thing. In other words, he's an educated man. At least 40, he had not been raised by his mother to know who he was. So, his mother would have raised him to realize that. I know you're not Egyptian. You're Israeli. Which side would be Israeli would be beat by the Egyptian and he killed the Egyptian. Oh, that was God's way of getting out of Egypt. Because if then he had to flee, because Pharaoh was home together. But again, God is also God warned him out anyway. Because he had to spend the next 40 years. First 40 years, he's in the Pharaoh's also. Next 40 years, he's in the wilderness. Why does he need to spend 40 years in the wilderness? Because when he's in Egypt, he got caused him to go to Egypt and leave the children of Israel out of Egypt and wander in the wilderness for the next 40 years. <laughs> so he got. The experience of wilderness living between age 40 and age 80. And then between age 80 and age 120, he led them into the wilderness. What can I say? That is the next class we need to read through the books of Genesis and Exodus. Genesis and Exodus. And the next class is going to be on the third. Sunday in Israel. Now, I want to start to hear a sermon on Genesis chapter 3. Anything from the Genesis chapter 3. Those who have not yet spoken will speak on the Bible. But the next set of speakers will be on. Genesis chapter 3. They need to read from Genesis and Exodus and prepare this on Genesis chapter. What are we doing? We are preparing you to be presenters. So we are teachers or preachers. So we want you to, your tongues to be totally apart. <laughs> and you are very confident, even more confident than before.
Everybody wants to start their attendance, really, so please sign for you. 